Welcome to the OpenTunes tutorial part 2. This is going to be a more in-depth and exploratory look at some of the features that were not included in the previous video, such as cutout animation, motion tweening, and special effects. We will also go over some minor updates and extra features of the program. This is going to be a bit of a longer video with some concentrated sections, so be sure to check the description for a table of contents. You will also find links to a couple of other YouTube channels which provide their own helpful tutorials for this program. I would also like to disclose that I did refer to a few of these tutorials when figuring out certain parts of this program to make this video. The purpose of this video is to deliver all of the information that I have learned through experimentation, the manual, and tutorials into a concise and streamlined lesson that you can use to learn this program as quickly as possible. With that said, let's begin. Since the time of the first video, there have been a few different updates released for the program. However, you can use the same download link provided to always find the up-to-date version. As of making this video, the version number is 1.0.2. Assuming that you have seen the first video, you may notice that our workspace looks a little different. This is because we can now remove, add, and rename workspaces rather than trying to reconfigure the default ones for our own use. Additionally, whereas in previous versions different workspaces had different exclusive menu commands such as rendering, in this version each new workspace has a universal menu with every command available. To create a new workspace for yourself, simply right-click one of the existing workspaces and select New Room. Double-click a room to rename it. You can then start opening windows to customize your workspace. Whereas in previous versions it was recommended to use the normal viewer and open up the toolbar and play commands, this time I would recommend opening the combo viewer, as for some reason you cannot open up the toolbar using the regular viewer. You may notice as you are building your workspace that at first you cannot place windows to the side of the main window. You must first place a window either on the top or the bottom of the main window, at which point the side slots become available. I don't know why this is a thing, but it's easy to work around. To delete a workspace, select a different room, then right-click the workspace and select Delete Room. If you are renaming and reconfiguring one of the default workspaces, then you will want to adjust the menu to the universal one. Right-click the workspace and select Customize Menu Bar of Room. This opens up a window where you can, if you want, drag and drop commands in and out of the menu to customize it as you want. However, I find that it is not worth it as the default menu features all of the functions that you would need, so I would simply click OK. For me personally, I chose to have three different workspaces. The first is a drawing workspace with as much canvas space as possible. The second is a rigging workspace for setting up cutout puppets. And the third is a motion and effects workspace for motion tweening and special effects. We will delve a little bit more into these different workspaces as we go through this tutorial. The first big feature that I would like to talk about in this tutorial is the cleanup function. This was offered as a default workspace and as a default function in the previous versions of the program, but we did not cover it because it was not necessarily an essential part of getting started. The cleanup function is used when you are importing traditionally drawn frames and cleaning them up for use in digital animation. If you plan on animating fully digitally, then you obviously don't have to pay too much attention to this section, but if you are a traditional animator, or if you're just curious, then you might want to know how this works. Whether you used a scanner or a camera to get your frames, importing them is as easy as dragging and dropping. However, they must be formatted in a certain way if they are all to import in the same level. Otherwise, OpenTunes will put each individual frame on its own column. In order to properly import your files, they must be formatted as a JPEG. The file must be configured as such, a file name in the front, followed by an underscore, followed by a four-digit number with each of the files in sequence. It doesn't matter if the number does not start as zero as long as they are in order. Once the files are formatted that way, you can drag and drop the first image in the sequence into a level, at which point the rest of the images will be imported along with it. If you are unable to individually rename your files because there are too many, Check the description for a link to a program called Flexible Renamer, which can help you rename files en masse to fit the format. You can also import pencil test videos, provided they are formatted as QuickTime Movies or .move. Once you have imported your frames, you may want to change your camera settings to fit the image. Go to X Sheet and select Camera Settings. Be sure to double check that your frame settings match what you want them to be before closing out of the window. You may have to play with the lock buttons in order to get it to work with you. You can also resize your imported images using the Movement tool, which we will cover a little bit later. Hold Ctrl and click and drag to move the image along the Z-axis to make it appear larger or smaller. Alternatively, you can do this with the camera by selecting it through the Schematic window. 
We will also go through this schematic later on. Once your images are imported, you can clean them up using the cleanup feature. This was designed to be used with scanned images, but you can use it with any drawing. The cleanup tool is designed to digitally ink your lines for you. Go to Scan Cleanup and select Cleanup Settings. Switch to a frame that has a decent enough drawing that you can see the results. Go back under Scan Cleanup and select Camera Test. You should see a red box appear. This is a cropping box that you can use to eliminate any white space on the paper. Or, if you'd like, you can drag and resize it to fill the whole paper. This is much easier than manually resizing it by typing the numbers into the settings, which can be a bit clunky, much like the camera settings. Once again, go under Scan Cleanup and select Preview Cleanup. You should see the image change to reflect the settings of the cleanup window. From here, we want to choose a method of colorization and anti-aliasing. Under Line Processing, you will find two settings, Color and Grayscale. Color can be used to give multiple colors to your lines after processing. However, if I'm being honest, I'm not entirely sure how it works, and chances are you're going to want to have black outlines anyways, so go ahead and choose Grayscale. If you would like, under the Grayscale setting, you can give your line a different color than black by selecting the black color swatch and using the Style Editor to change the color. From here, we want to choose a method of anti-aliasing. There are three methods available, Standard, None, and Morphological. Standard behaves similarly to the brightness, contrast, and sharpness filters that you might find in a program such as Photoshop. According to the manual, this method should only be used if you plan on resizing the imports to smaller than 90% of their original size. None acts similar to a binary threshold filter, giving you only straight white or straight black pixels, with the brightness setting determining how thick your lines are. For the record, the reason you see this giant wall of black in my image is because when I took the pictures of these frames with my camera, the lighting wasn't the best, so there was a bit of a gradient. Ideally, you would have better lighting so that you would only see your outlines. You can use the sharpness and despeckling settings to eliminate noise and jagged lines if you'd like. Be careful when dragging these sliders around, as causing too great a change at a time can sometimes cause the program to either freeze up or crash. The morphological filter is a sort of hybrid between the two, giving you straight black and white lines while also giving them a bit of a blur to make it appear smoother. This blur can be adjusted using the MLAA intensity slider. According to the manual, if you use morphological anti-aliasing, you do not need to reduce the size of the image. Once you have found a setting that you like, you can, if you want, save it as a preset for later use. Otherwise, select all of the frames you would like the cleanup process to be applied to, Go to Scan Cleanup and select Cleanup. If you would like, check the box to preview which frame is being worked on, and then press Cleanup All. You should be left with a finished and rendered version of the frames, where the white pixels are translated to transparent. If for some reason you are trying to clean up frames for the second time, you may get a couple of different warnings. The first is a warning indicating that it already detects a cleaned up drawing in its files. If this happens, be sure to check Delete Existing Level and Create a New Level with Selected Drawings Only, and then select Apply to All. Otherwise, you may get a warning saying that the two levels' resolutions are different from one another. If for some reason you cannot get it to work, then it's best to manually delete the levels and try again. If you look directly under C, you should see a folder labeled OpenTunes Stuff. If you go under here, and then under the file marked Sandbox, you should find a dropping spot for all the different levels, files, palettes, and whatnot that OpenTunes will store when you save your projects. While you can specify a different output folder for specific projects, it involves setting up folders for each of the different project files, and I personally find that it is not worth it. In the Sandbox folder, go to the folder named Drawings, find the file associated with your level, and then delete it. It should have the same file name as the images you imported. Once you have your rendered cleanup files, you can then color them in using paints and brushes. However, you may notice that the level is a raster level. It is possible to convert this to a vector level. However, I should warn you that this feature is incredibly buggy, so proceed at your own risk. If you would like to save before trying this, you should use the new Save All feature. Select your frames, then go under Level, and click Convert to Vectors. You can play with the settings if you'd like, but I found that the default settings work fairly well. Ideally, this should leave you with a vectorized version of your cleaned up files. Unfortunately, I personally was not able to get this to work properly. It would always reach a specific frame at which point the program would crash. I guess all I can say is I hope this is another thing programmers are able to fix in a later update.
I would now like to go over some of the new updates that came with the latest version of this program. As mentioned before, one of the first and foremost is a new Save All button that allows you to save the entire project at once instead of having to save scenes and palettes separately. In order to load a project, all you do is load a scene file. The next feature is a simplified way of activating the onion skin. If you'll recall, in the first video we had to turn on onion skin by first right-clicking and activating it, and then selecting it through the level strip. Now, the entire process can be done from within the exposure sheet. If you hover your cursor above or below the onion skin symbol, you should see these little yellow dots appear. Click on the dots or click and drag to expose the onion skin for that frame. Note that there are two different sections in which the dots will appear. If you click directly beneath the symbol, you will see a red line extending from the symbol to that dot. This is in relation to the symbol itself and will change whenever you switch to a different frame. The second spot, which is slightly left to that, is directly linked to that frame and will not change even if you switch. Click the dots again to turn the onion skin off, or right click and select Deactivate Onion Skin. You may notice that while onion skin is activated, that all of your drawings and shapes have a slight transparency to them. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find a way to turn this off even when playing with the onion skin settings. Now let's talk about some of the uncovered features when it comes to painting, particularly vector styles and textures. Again making sure that Auto Apply is checked, go to your style editor and switch to one of the different tabs next to the Plane tab. You'll see different styles that you can use to edit your vectors and colors. Textures are used primarily for fills, but they can be used with lines, however they will appear stretched. The texture is more of an overlay and will retain its size and position even if you resize or move the shape. Kind of like the show Chowder, if you've ever seen that. The Special and Custom tabs allow you to give your vector line different shapes and particle effects. With the Special tab, you can also change the color. The Vector Brush tab gives your line different textures, much like Adobe Illustrator can do. For each of these different styles, you can go under the Settings tab to change individual settings. Some lines have more settings than others, and other lines don't have any at all. To remove textures and effects, go to the Special tab and click on the top left icon. You may need to readjust the color. You can also install your own styles and textures under the OpenTune Stuff folder in the folder marked Library. There's one other important aspect of painting that I need to talk about. If you have used Flash or Toon Boom, you may be used to the idea that lines and fills are technically separate entities. However, in open tunes, they are directly related, and its shape must always have an outline, even if it is not visible. If you wish to remove the outline from a shape, there are two different things you can do. The first is to set the color of the outline to be the same as the fill. The second is to select the shape using the arrow tool, go to the stroke setting in the toolbar, and set the number to zero. You may notice that the stroke line is still visible. However, this is only so you know it is there. Once you select the camera view or the preview option, you will see that the line has disappeared. This can present a problem to people who are used to doing cutout animation and often erase the outlines around the joints. However, there is a workaround that I have discovered and when we get to cutout animation I will talk more about it. You may also be wondering how to apply gradients as a color. For some reason, OpenTunes treats gradients as a special effect and they are applied in a similar manner. When we go over special effects and how to use the schematic, we will touch on how to apply gradients as well. Before then, let's look at all of the individual tools that OpenTunes has to offer. We went over the basic ones in the previous video, but now let's look at some of the different ones that we can use. The Edit tool is used mainly when editing keyframes and motion paths. When using this tool, the program will automatically create keyframes on the timeline. We can edit various aspects of our shape, such as position, rotation, scale, and shear. We can also reposition the center of our object, which is by default the center of the camera. The selection tool is pretty self-explanatory. A couple things to make note of, however. To select an object, you have to click directly on its outline. This tool also uses a somewhat outdated method when making marquee selections. If you drag the marquee to the right, it will only select objects that are completely surrounded by your selection. When dragging to the left, however, it will select any object that touches the selection. The brush tool is also pretty self-explanatory. You have min and max sizes for if you're using a tablet. The accuracy setting is for line smoothing. The higher the setting, the more your line will stay the same after it is drawn. A lower accuracy means a smoother line. 
Checking break allows the tool to create splits in the line when you draw sharp corners. I would leave this unchecked. Pressure allows for pressure sensitivity when you use a tablet. Preset allows you to save and load custom brush presets. You can also set the shape of your line cap and the shape of corners. I'm honestly not entirely sure what miter is. There are a couple different settings for the brush tool if you work between raster and vector layers. This holds true for a couple different tools as well. Selective means the brush will not paint over anything that has already been painted. This is so you can paint in the background of outlines, however it will remove anti-aliasing from the outlines. Pencil mode removes anti-aliasing completely so that you paint with a binary line. The geometric tool is a pen and shape tool both in one. You can choose from a rectangle, circle, or multi-sided polygon. Polyline refers to the pen tool like you would be used to using with Photoshop or Illustrator. Arc will draw a single curve. Autofill will automatically fill the shape with the same color as the outline. I'm not sure what auto group does. The type tool is disappointingly limited in this program. You cannot click and drag to create text boxes. You can select any font, but you can only choose from a limited range of sizes. And when you are done typing, it automatically becomes a shape. You cannot go back in and edit the text again. The fill bucket offers a few different ways of filling in shapes. The first is the traditional way of clicking within the shape, but you can also click and drag with a rectangular marquee or create a freehand shape by either drawing it or using a polyline. The selection must surround the entire object. You can also, if you would like, discriminate between painting lines and painting fills. Selective behaves similar to the brush. I'm not sure what onion skin does. Checking frame range will let you fill an object as it moves across the stage in different frames. This works best for simple motion tweens and you may have issues when you're selecting changing objects or drawn animation. Select the first frame and then click to place a mark inside your object. Then move forward a few frames and click to place another mark. You will note that the objects have been filled in between and even ahead of where you place the mark. Make sure to check for any errors. The paintbrush tool is exclusive only to raster layers. It is essentially a single size brush tool that has the ability to discriminate between lines and areas. Personally, I see it as a bit of an unnecessary tool, and I wish that instead the brush tool simply had the same capability. There would be no reason to have this one. The eraser is pretty self-explanatory. I'm not sure why it has a selective function, as it does not do anything. The tape tool is a useful tool that lets you close gaps and lines when working with vector drawings. You can do so by clicking and dragging between endpoints. I would also make sure to check Join Vectors and Smooth, as you will get better results, especially if you are drawing with a tablet. If you do not select Join Vectors, then it is possible that there will be a gap when you try to connect the two endpoints, especially if there is a sharp corner. The Finger tool is a bit of an odd one, and I can't really get it to do anything. The most that I've been able to accomplish is to remove some anti-aliasing around lines, but this one is still a bit of a mystery to me. It is also only exclusive to raster layers. You will notice two dropper tools. One has an RGB symbol next to it, and this is the one that you will want to use. This will change the color of whichever style you have to whichever color is selected. If you have Passive Pick enabled, then you can see an RGB reading at the toolbar. The Style Picker will only switch to the line style that you select. I'm not sure why it's there, because it doesn't change the current style to that style. It just switches over. The Ruler tool is, again, pretty self-explanatory. The Control Point Editor allows you to edit vector lines similar to the White Arrow tool in Adobe Illustrator. The Pinch tool is a type of deformation tool. Make sure you check the box marked Manual, as for some reason you can't really change any settings if you don't. Changing the size will allow you to change the area of effect. I'm not really sure what corner does. The Bike Pump tool allows you to change line thickness at different points. The Magnet tool is another deformation tool that behaves similar to the Pinch tool, however, you can use it on multiple shapes at one time. The Bender tool is yet another deformation tool, but it behaves rather oddly and I cannot really get it to work. It doesn't seem to do much and it doesn't work very well, so I would encourage you to avoid this one. The Iron tool allows you to smooth out wrinkles and lines by rubbing back and forth. And finally, the Cutter tool will make a very discreet slice when you click on a spot in the line. Note that the different slices will still remain together as a group. 
In order to select individual slices, you want to right-click the object and select Ungroup. Be careful when making slices in shape outlines, as making too large of a gap can cause your fill to disappear. These next few tools have to do with motion tracking and cutout animation, and it is at this point that I would like to direct you to YouTube user Simon, whose video tutorials were quite helpful when I was stuck in figuring these tools out. I am going to try and condense the information that I've learned both on my own and with his help, but I would still encourage you to check his videos out. Let's start with cutout animation, as I'm sure it's a method that a lot of you are interested in using if you haven't already. Ignore this torso for now, as we'll get back to it later. OpenTunes features two different methods of doing cutout animation. The first involves a tool called the Plastic Tool. The Plastic Tool lays a mesh over a still drawing, which you then build a skeleton around. By controlling the skeleton, the mesh will deform, and thus the object will deform. This tool also works in either a vector or a raster layer. In a new column, draw an object that you would like to animate. In our case, we're going to be using a simple blob. Then switch to the plastic tool and select the button that says Create Mesh. Edit the settings to change mesh density if you'd like. Then click Apply. You should see a green mesh overlaid on top of your object. Note that the mesh is part of its own column. In the tool settings, under Mode, select Build Skeleton. Click on the mesh to place joints. The first joint you place will be the root. You can branch out from other joints by first selecting that joint and then clicking elsewhere. Once you've built your skeleton, go under Mode again and select Animate. Be sure you are in the mesh column and not the drawing column, otherwise you will not be able to move the skeleton. Click and drag the joints to deform the mesh and animate the drawing. You should see keyframes being created as you move the object. One other thing you can do is to paint certain areas of the drawing where the mesh will not deform. Under Mode, select Paint Rigid. You should see a green overlay on top of your drawing. By clicking and dragging, parts of the mesh will turn red, signaling that they will not be deformed when you move the skeleton. If you have ever done 3D animation, it is similar to painting weights. This is used, for example, if you only wanted the mesh to deform around where the joints were. The second method of animation, which you are probably more used to, is rigging and animating a puppet using individual parts. To demonstrate, we will be using this rather crudely drawn torso with two arms, but you can get as complex as you want. It doesn't really matter what order your parts are in, but they must each be in their own individual columns. To assemble the skeleton, we are going to be using a window called the Schematic. This is an important tool in this program, so it's good to get to know how to use it. The Schematic is used both to assemble cutout skeletons and to apply special effects, clipping masks, and gradients. We use the Schematic to link different parts and effects together in a parent-child hierarchy. When it comes to cutout animation, this is used so that when one part moves, all of the parts beneath it will move as well. By default, each new object is linked directly to the table, in other words, the background. If I move an individual part of the skeleton, it will move on its own. These green nodes in the schematic represent our different columns. Arrange them in a manner that is convenient to you. Connect different nodes together by clicking and dragging between the red and blue lights. The red light indicates a parent connection, and the blue light indicates a child connection. For example, for our torso, we will have the torso be the primary parent, then the upper arms, then the lower arms, and then the hands. If you have arranged the nodes as I have here on the screen, then make sure that you are properly connecting red to blue instead of the other way around. Now that our connections have been made, if I go to rotate one of the arms, you can see that all the parts beneath it rotate as well. Be sure to use the Edit tool, switch to Center Mode, and set the center of rotation for each part to where you want it to swivel. Select the Skeleton tool from the toolbar. You may notice that its mode is set to Build Skeleton. Because we used the schematic to set up our rigging, we can ignore this. Instead, switch the mode to Animate. You can now click and rotate different parts of the skeleton. Provided your rigging is set up properly, you should see it animate as you would expect it to. If you would like, you can try animating using the Inverse Kinematics mode. This acts as a sort of smart animation tool that works around a single root joint which in this case is our torso. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but give it a try and see if you like it. Be careful though, as it can sometimes act up, especially if you select a different joint to be the root. 
If you look at the timeline, you can see that keyframes are automatically created as we move the skeleton. By the way, if you remember the level strip from the previous video, then you'll recall that it doesn't really have much of a function. However, when it comes to cutout animation, it proves invaluable. This is because the level strip can be used to store different images for different parts such as hand positions, lip positions, or eyes. To demonstrate, let's add a new position for the right hand. To insert a new frame, either right click the level strip and select Insert, or simply move to the next frame on the timeline and begin drawing. Using the onion skin, we can draw a new hand position over top our old one. We can now store that position for later use. To swap out positions, select the point where you would like to make the change and delete all of the remaining frames for that part. Then drag and drop the position from the level strip into the timeline and extend the frames as you would like. You'll notice that the new part takes the same position and orientation as the previous. One thing you may notice as we've been animating is that our puppet has no outlines. Generally when doing this kind of cutout animation, you erase the outlines around where two different joints come together. But with outlines and fills being directly related, we cannot erase the outline of a part without its fill disappearing, so we need to find a different solution. I'd like to show you a workaround that I discovered while working with this tool. Now I'm not an expert in cutout animation, as you can probably tell, so it's possible that this is already a widely done practice. It may also be that you need to tweak this design a bit to get it to work for you, but hopefully it will give you an idea. Copy and paste each part of your puppet into its own new column, and change all of the colors to black. Then, using the selection tool, select the object and change its stroke value to a higher number. Using the green bar on the left, click and drag the column until it is behind the part of the puppet that it is reflecting. Repeat this process with all of your different parts. You may want to rename them so that you do not lose track. Be sure to arrange the nodes in the schematic as you do this. Once you are done, give each outline part a child connection to its respective part, much like you see in the schematic here. You do not need to connect the outline parts to each other. You now have a puppet whose outline will contour to its inner shape. To animate overlaps in the outline, such as bends in clothing or moving the arm over the chest, I found a couple different methods. The first is to use the edit tool and move that part by holding control along the Z axis until it is in front of the other parts. Then, select the back outlines and, using the Edit tool, change the position, size, and shape until they reflect the result you'd like to see. The result here may look a little crude, but hopefully you get the idea. The second method would be the more traditional way of erasing part of the outline piece and arranging the parts in order until they work as you would like. Now that we've learned how to create and animate our cutout puppet, let's talk a little bit more about motion editing and working with keyframes. To do this, we're going to switch to our third workspace, which introduces a new window called the Function Editor. For almost all of this process, you're going to be using the Edit tool, so make sure you're comfortable with using it. You'll recall that if you use the Edit tool to make a change to your shape, it will automatically create a keyframe in your timeline. However, you can at any point create a keyframe for all the different aspects, size, shape, rotation, etc., by clicking on the small keyframe icon at the console. By the way, I'm not sure what that little pink dot in the center of the stage is, but the center of rotation is on the ball and that's all you really need to care about. Moving ahead a few frames, we'll click and drag our ball to the other corner of a stage, which will create a new keyframe for us and automatically motion tween. Looking at our function editor, you'll notice that on the right there is a browser where our objects and effects are arranged in a hierarchy. If we select our object, it will bring up all of the keyframes for the different aspects on a chart for us to see. If you have a special effect attached to your object, which we will talk about later, you will have to click on that effect in the browser in order to bring up its keyframes for that object. To better edit our motion path, we're going to extend our onion skin nice and long in either direction. Let's say we want to give our motion path both an ease and a curve. Using our onion skin, we can go into the middle of these tweens and set the position of the ball where it should be at that point. We can use this to easily create curves and eases for better motion paths. If you really want, you can select keyframes and edit them by individual number using the function editor. Click and drag keyframes to reposition them. You can select multiple keyframes by quickly clicking and dragging to create a marquee selection. To delete a keyframe, simply press delete. 
I know I've said this a few times before, but just to clarify again, there is technically a 3D space that you are working in, and to move an object along the Z-axis, all you have to do is hold control and then click and drag. By default, the Z position is set to 12, which is considered flat. One last feature with motion tweening is the ability to loop keyframes. If you have an object whose actions you want to be repeated indefinitely, you can select the little loop icon beneath the last keyframe, at which point all of the previous keyframes will be repeated for the entire length of the animation. Along with motion tweening, OpenTunes also has a shape tweening feature, though it is not perfect. Draw your beginning and end shapes using the exposure sheet, and then, using the level strip, insert several blank frames in between the two. Holding Shift, select all of the frames. You should see a small icon appear to the right that says, In Between. Select this and then choose a method of interpolation, then click In Between. You should see the shape transform. Note that this does not work very well for changing colors. Now that we know how to motion and shape tween and work with keyframes, let's move on to adding special effects. For this we are again going to use our schematic. In the bottom right corner, select the button labeled Toggle FX slash Stage Schematic. You should see the title and layout change. This new layout will show connections between the different elements and any attached special effects or gradients, rather than the attachments to each other. You'll notice that every element is attached to an exposure sheet, which is itself attached to an output. The exposure sheet is essentially what our camera sees. We can ignore the output module for now. By threading the connection from different modules through effects and then to the exposure sheet, we can change what the camera sees. Right-click a module that you would like to add an effect to, and then select Insert Effects. If you select Add Effects, it will add the effect, but it will not tie that effect to the exposure sheet you would have to connect it manually. For our demonstration, we are going to add a simple blur effect to our ball. Note that the ball is no longer directly connected to the exposure sheet. Instead, it is threaded through the effect, which is then connected to the sheet. It is possible to connect both to the exposure sheet at the same time, at which point you would see the effect of both. You'll notice that the effect does not show up in our function editor. In order to get it to appear, we must select the effect from the browser, at which point the keyframes, if there are any, will be visible. To edit the effect, right-click the module and select Edit Effects. This will bring up a window where you can change the various settings. It will also feature a button that you can use to set a keyframe for the effect. To actually see the effect, make sure to toggle either Sub-Camera View or Preview. When it comes to open tunes, gradients are seen as their own effects and shapes, rather than a color that you apply to an existing shape. Be sure to choose either multi-linear or multi-radial gradient, as those give you more options for customization. Remember that because they are treated as effects, you will not see them if the preview has not been toggled. Gradients are given their own column on the exposure sheet. You edit gradients the same way you would edit any other special effect. You can add color points by clicking anywhere on the line. Remove them by clicking and dragging the arrow off of the line. Increasing the quantity will increase the number of times the gradient gets repeated. Click and drag the small ring to adjust the gradient's period, in other words, its radius. I can't really tell what cycle is supposed to do. One important thing to remember when working with gradients is that you must set the last point to have a mat of zero. Otherwise, its color will stretch on endlessly. If, for example, you wanted to create a vignette, then you would set the first point to be transparent instead of the last. If you want to color objects using gradients, then you'll want to learn how to use layer blending and clipping masks. This, too, is treated as a special effect. Link the two objects together using the stage schematic so that when one moves, the other will move with it. It does not matter which order you put them in. Then, under the FX schematic, right-click your gradient, go to Insert Effects, then Layer Blending INO, and select the method of layer blending you would like to use. In my case, I colored my object completely white and selected the gradient to be Multiply. You should see two nodes labeled Fore and Back. Make sure that the shape is linked to the Back node and the gradient is applied to the Fore node. Then, delete any links between the shape and the exposure sheet. Now let's move on to something completely different. 
If you've ever worked with After Effects, then you may have tried motion tracking. OpenTunes actually features their own motion tracking tool, which you can use to track different objects or spots in video files. Import videos by dragging and dropping them onto the timeline. Note that they must be formatted as a QuickTime Movie or .move in order for them to successfully import. Select the tracking tool from your toolbar and click and drag to draw a box around the object or spot that you would like to track. Then go to Level and select Tracking. Now I've tried playing with the different settings in this window and I've found that the best settings are as follows. Threshold 1, Sensibility 0, Check Variable Region Size, and Check Include Background. Make sure to select all of the frames that you would like to apply the tracking to and then press Track. If all goes well, you should see the tracking boundary follow the object throughout the video. If you are having troubles, for example if the box is not following, try doing a few frames at a time rather than the entire video or adjusting the settings. Also, if you see the box start to get off center in later frames, you can stop, adjust the box, and then track the remaining frames again. One thing I also should mention is that you can track multiple objects at a time within the same video. The tracking boxes will be numbered in sequential order, which is important for later use. Once we have our tracking locations in place, we can attach objects and gradients to them. I've created a small ball as an example here. Parent the movie node to the column that you want to track. Then, in the bottom right corner, select the button that says Switch Output Port Display Mode. This will switch the connection indicators from colored lights to A and B indicators. If you would like, you can keep the layout this way. You should notice that the movie and the column are connected from B to B. Hover over the B output on the movie node and you should see a small arrow icon appear. Click and drag upwards until the B switches to A and then to 1. This indicates that the child nodes are now specifically following the number 1 tracking box. If you had multiple boxes, you would drag it until it matches the number that you want it to follow. Reposition your object to where you want it to be in relation to the box. In our case, it is directly on top of it. If we scrub through the movie now, we can see that our object is successfully following the tracking box. One other tool associated with motion tracking is the hook tool. This is used to set multiple points of relation between the object and the tracking box. With the object column selected, simply click to set different points of relation. You can set as many as you'd like. You will again notice that they are numbered in order. Then, similar to setting the tracking, in the B input of your column, click and drag up on the arrows until you reach the numbered hook points. You should see the object switch positions in relation to these points. So now, if you wanted to recreate Who Framed Roger Rabbit in OpenTunes, you would know how. The final feature we need to go over for OpenTunes is importing audio, and fortunately, this is a simple one. Importing audio is as simple as dragging and dropping the file into a new column. You can click the megaphone icon to play back the sound Violated. and drag the slider next to it to adjust the volume. You can also hear bits of the sound by scrubbing through the timeline using the scrubber at the bottom of the console, but I found that it is a little bit choppy. If you play back your movie using the console, you will find that you cannot hear your audio. Instead, you will have to go to File and select Preview and then check the small music icon before playing the video. Violated! No! And with that, we are finally done. Before we leave, I would like to give my own personal opinion on this software. As it is right now, I think this program is more capable than Flash, but less streamlined and intuitive than Toon Boom Studio. If you already have Toon Boom, then there's no real reason to get this program, as the only advantage it has is that it's free. But if you aren't satisfied with Flash, or you don't have any animation software, or you're simply curious, then I would encourage you to give it a try. It's quickly becoming easier to use as bugs get ironed out and dead weight gets eliminated, and I can easily see it becoming more mainstream in the near future. Bottom line, you really have nothing to lose by spending a day or two to see if you like it. I hope that these videos have been helpful for you. As mentioned before, I will put links to further tutorials in the description of this video. Thank you for watching, and good luck.